Welcome everyone to our NCAA Social Series. I'm Andy Katz. We are here at the NCAA headquarters in Indianapolis with the new NCAA president, former governor from Massachusetts, Charlie Baker. Welcome to the NCAA. Um, you were just getting started here after being introduced a couple of months ago. A lot to unpack, but what are your first priorities as you get settled? Well, I think first of all, I want to I want to get to know the conferences. So one of the things I've said I want to do is either meet virtually or in person with all 100 plus or minus conferences at some point during my first 100 days. Um, I'm mostly interested in listening in those conversations. I want to hear what people have to say. I'm going to take a lot of notes and hopefully I'll find some common ground among a bunch of things that people would really like, seem to be agreeing that they would like to see us focus on and then maybe some things where there's some differences of opinion that I'll have to figure out um, how to engage people on. But I think it's really important, and it's been true every job I've ever had. You know, when you show up, the first thing you should do is um, listen and give everybody a chance to, to have at it a little bit. Uh, I think the second thing is um, to spend uh, some time with the folks in, in Brian's shop talking about student mental health. Um, I talk to a lot of student athletes just as a matter of course, but I've also talked to a ton of them since I got this job. Um, and uh, while many of them love their student athlete experience, their teams are where their friends and their peeps came from, it's a big base of their support, it has all the elements you'd want it to have. Um, some of them also talked about the fact that they are public figures in their community and, and if they stumble, um, the social media stuff can be pretty rugged and a couple of the stories they told were, were pretty compelling. Um, and, and the other thing I heard a lot about, and this is mostly from the adults, coaches and um, presidents and, and athletic directors, is the wild west of the NIL. Or the one, um, one AD in particular said that the only thing that's true about NIL is that everybody's lying. And, um, and that just creates, in my opinion, huge issues for student athletes and families. Um, I would love to see the feds, and, and I think we as an organization need to work on this too, coming up with what I would describe as some transparency and accountability standards around NIL. For example, there probably ought to be a uniform standard contract. There pro you probably ought to have to register your contracts. You probably ought to have to get certified to be an agent. There's a whole bunch of things we can do here um, to make it more accessible and accountable to the kids and families who are participating in NIL. And, and boy, I'll tell you the noise coming from, from the schools about the, the lack of any accountability or transparency around this, pretty intense. So a uh, lot to sort of pick apart there. And I, I wanna go back to um, sort of comparing being a governor and what you're now about to, to tackle. Um, I have some familiarity, I'm from the state of Massachusetts, Boston, is completely different, that area, than Western Massachusetts. Two completely different uh, populations, rural, urban. It mirrors the NCAA. There are city schools, there are state universities, there are private universities, major D1, D2, D3. How did you handle all those different interests in a state, as small as Massachusetts, but still a lot of different interests, and, and how would you compare that to what you're looking at in terms of the entire membership and how many, there are so many different agendas and interests across the country. Well, you've got a 1,100 member institutions, 520,000 student athletes, um, and a lot of voices and plenty of opinions. And, and I think in some respects, there are some comparisons you can draw between being a, a governor of a state with seven million people um, and having a job like this. But I will come back to one of the reasons I wanna do that listening gig with so many of the folks who were part of those conferences um, is for just that reason. I mean, the, the one thing I did, I think, pretty well, and Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito, who is my partner, did, was we got out of the office. I mean, she visited all 351 cities and towns. I probably got the 250 of them. Um, they got to know us. We got to know them. And the back and forth that took place between them and us was, was a trust-based conversation. And and I really do think, you know, if you want to, if you want to find common ground, if you want to help people get someplace, usually it starts with some baseline trust, appreciation, and understanding. 
and, and a belief that people will be and have been heard. And um, I, I do think there's some comparisons there. Obviously, a national platform is just different than, um, than one state, but, but your, your analogy in some respects I think is a good one. Conference commissioners, certainly in college football, in the power leagues, have huge power. Um, and this has been something going on for decades where the NCAA president can only do so much. And obviously the conference commissioners at that level control a lot. How do you plan to sort of navigate that with especially the power leagues, you know, that, that, can, control, that can control so much? Well, I've spent a lot of time talking to them. Um, I started talking to them pretty much as soon as I was announced. Um, I've had meetings with them. Um, I'll continue to engage with them. I mean, I, I think the, I do agree that, uh, the way I think about it's a little different maybe, which is I think of the Power Five folks as, and, the, and which is, you know, maybe 100 of the 1,100 schools, probably less, um, and maybe 10,000 of the 520,000 athletes. Um, their, their business model is definitely different than the rest of college athletics, and I think that's important. Um, and it's significant, and I think it's probably something that needs to be part of the way we think about how we operate going forward, and certainly how we think about the issues that everybody's dealing with in a very sort of fast-paced and changing world. But, um, but just because they're different doesn't mean they're not playing football and basketball and running track and swimming and wrestling and doing everything else that everybody else is doing. And, um, and at the end of the day, um, we all have a requirement, a commitment to the student athletes who are um, sort of fundamental to what we're all about. How do you deal with that as a governor? You could sign legislation and, you know, sort of, the buck stops or can stop with you. In this role, that's not always the case. It's very committee heavy, a lot of acronyms. Um, a lot of acronyms in government. Yeah, that's true. Plenty of committees yes, too. Yes, yeah. that's true. Subcommittees and so on. But, but how do you deal with that, that you can't make every decision? Maybe you can influence some, but you can't, you're not going to be the deciding factor. How do you deal with that? Well, I think the, again, I think you, you hit the nail on the head is you can influence. Um, and, and honestly, that's kind of what it means to be a governor, too. You can influence, um, especially when it comes to legislation. Um, every legislator and every legislature will tell you that if you're the governor, that they make law. And they're right. They do. Um, we have the opportunity, if we're governor, to, um, to sign it or send it back or amend it or all the rest. I happen to think that you know, that's a slightly different process, but fundamentally they are both roles that are based on influence more than, you know, direct power and authority. In this highly partisan world that we live in, how were you able to get people to agree that came from so many different backgrounds and agendas? I'm a pretty good listener. I mean, most of the time, um, Everybody doesn't come at things the same way, right? I mean, they have different life experiences, they have different work experiences, and, and what you really have to do is figure out where one person's experiences, which may translate into one way of thinking about something, um, actually does dovetail with somebody else's. And, uh, and, I, and, I think, and I think sometimes being the third party, being the one who's listening to a whole bunch of different people who are talking to you about what they think the problem is and what the answer should be, uh, actually gives you a chance to do some translating in terms of how they're talking about that to figure out where it is that the threads of sort of common ground are, are coming from. And that, that is, I mean, we did a lot of that over the last eight years. And I would argue it's kind of, you know, everybody should do it because it's, you learn more from listening than you do from talking. So to that point with NIL, again, 50 states could have 50 different laws uh, as it relates to that. Obviously, the hope is that there's some sort of federal legislation. Um, the general public still, well, why doesn't the NCAA just make a rule? Why can't they just make a rule? You're probably going to get asked that. What will be your answer as to why guardrails from NIL can't supersede what goes on in state houses across the country? Well, I think part of that is just a function of the nature of this is a volunteer organization, right? I mean, people join the 
NCAA. Um, I think the, I, I, I do think, as I said um, before, I think we should be running our own track on what we think consumer protections for, for student athletes and families should look like at the same time we're talking to Congress. If Congress ends up doing something that has, you know, more throw weight, I suppose, than what the NCAA and its members could do on their own. But I think both of these conversations will inform the others. And if, you know, if we can figure out a way to get something done that creates transparency and accountability for athletes and families um, and, and puts some, what I would describe as uniformity into the way NIL works, um, that'd be great, okay? But I also think we can, we can and should take a run at making sure we're having, I'm telling you, I've heard from so many colleges and universities from every part of the country about how concerned they are about the Wild West and the complete lack of information about what's going on out there. And, um, and, and no one knew what NIL was going to be like until he actually had it. So trying to figure out what a, what a framework would look like or what some rules might be or how you might protect um, student athletes and families um, and create some accountability. You really couldn't do that until you actually saw what it was going to look like coming out. And a whole bunch of people who might have, you know, two years ago said, let it run. Who cares? A lot of those people are now saying to me, boy, we really need to come up with some way to make this a lot more accessible to everybody. You mentioned mental health. Um, what tangibly can the NCAA office do? Because we've discussed this many times where, especially in rural schools, they may not have a mental health professional, not just on campus, but in the town. It may have to be telehealth, and then there's you know, regulations to that if you're in a different state and all that. What can be done to help student athletes in the mental health space from this office? Well, I think there's a couple of things, but one thing definitely we can do. Um, there are a lot of, there are more and more best practices that people have been developing around how to both um, manage issues associated with mental health, but also to identify them. Um, there are risk assessment tools that are becoming available that weren't available um, a few years ago. I mean, as that type of stuff continues to evolve, there's no reason why we can't get on a Zoom or something or some other form of communication with athletic directors, coaches, presidents, school healthcare organizations, and say, here's some of what the, the leading authorities on best practices around risk assessment, around self-identification, around other issues that you should be making available to and can make available to your student athletes and to your medical staffs or to whoever it is that's actually worrying about that at your institution. Um, and I think the I think the momentum on that one is going to continue to, to drive a lot more of what I would describe as distributable capabilities out to people. And I think that's, that's a big role we can play. And we can be a convener of a lot of the best thoughts and, and the best thinking on this and, and then push it out and make it available to people. It's not, some of this is, um, I don't know, we have a shortage of behavioral health providers everywhere in America. And, that, that even may be true in other parts of the world, the Western world anyway, um, for a whole bunch of reasons. And when I was governor, we put a lot of money and a lot of time into expanding our mental health and behavioral health footprint. And we did a lot of good work there, but they're gonna have to do more. Um, but at the same time, there is a growing body of knowledge about what people, lay people and other folks can do to both help others and help themselves. And more of that needs to get out into, uh, out into our, our schools. You spoke often about how college athletics, part of your family, you, your wife, your children. Um, and my brother. And your brother. You, you clearly could have, you had such a great, successful run as governor. You could have continued in politics on the national level. You chose not to do that. You chose to come here. Why? Um, I do think it's a particularly interesting and complicated time for college athletics. And I do think college athletics is probably one of the truly great human p potential development programs we have. I know all kinds of people, and so do my kids, um, who wouldn't have gone to college or graduated if it wasn't for college athletics. And, um, and I certainly believe there will be changes. And I certainly believe change is coming, and that's okay. 
Um, but if I can help make that change, the kind of change that actually enhances the experience for college athletes, whether you're in a Power Five conference or a D3 program, um, I, will, I will have done something that I think is really important. And, and I think the, um, I could have done a lot of other things, right? But this feels more to me like a, uh, another opportunity to serve, and that's what made it interesting, very interesting for me relative to whatever else I could have done, especially at this time. Well, we look forward to finding out what that's gonna look like next year, next month, couple months, and the years ahead. Uh, Charlie, really appreciate your time. Happy to see you, Andy, and hope all goes well. As always, you can go to ncaa.org slash social series where all our social series are archived. Great conversations like this one, you can find them right there. Mm -hmm.